Class number four of seven in the course series, God's Will. Um, and we've had several classes talking a bit about different aspects and the multidimensional aspects of his will. Uh, we've talked about a testament. We've talked about many things. But tonight I want to talk about the promises of God's will. And a lot of times when we hear certain words, we think, well, I already know this. You know, <laughs> I know all about the promises of God. But how many of you believe God could surprise us yes. with a fresh uh, revelation? So, of course, another uh, very familiar scripture, 2 Corinthians 1.20. For all the promises of God in him are yes and in him. Very important. In him. Amen. Amen. Unto the glory of God by us. So unto the glory of God by us. In other words, the glory is revealed by us. How? Through the promises. So a promise, and uh, kind of give you some foundational here. A promise is a decree achieved before we see. <laughs> it's a decree achieved before before we see it. A promise is an absolute premise. As we said, a decree and a guarantee. And it's glory wrapped. So promises excel with the glory. And promise is the engagement or the activation to begin what's done already. Sound good? So we're going to talk about premises, we're going to talk about potential, and how we are partakers of that divine promise. And again, you know, you can wave me down if you've got something to say, um, question or comment, but we're going to have a, ground, a great round table as well. And I've also got a very special guest, as I said, who will be joining me up here in a few minutes. But let's talk about the premises versus the promises. <laughs> The premises versus the promises of God. He is a mediator of what? Better, Better promises. Hebrews 8, 6. But now hath he, meaning Christ Jesus, obtained a more excellent ministry. How by much also he is a mediator. Ah, there we go with the mediator again. Of what? A better covenant or an advancing. When it says better, it simply means advancing. It, it doesn't mean better, best, best. It means advancing. So he is a mediator of a more advanced covenant. I love that. Which was established upon, look at this, better promises. What makes a promise better is that it's more advanced. God is not, God is not um, revisiting anything, although he already did it before we were born. He's not revisiting to repeat, as I should say. He is advancing. So, some cannot. This is the problem that people have and don't obtain their promise. Some cannot give up their preconceived ideas of what the promise will look like. Mm -hmm. Or if they've already arrived at the premise of their own making. So sometimes promises can actually be fulfilled and we missed it. Because of that very thing, of our preconceived ideas of what the promise will look like. We would prefer, not us, we're the advanced group, but I mean, you know, those other people. We would prefer to have a promise excel what we like now. But God says, I can't excel what you like now because I am constantly growing you. So if I keep thinking the promise is going to look like what I think it will look like, then I am putting it in a box. 
when we'll see that sometimes the promise even actually looks like a problem. Come on, somebody. So Hebrews 6.12 says that she be not slothful or stubborn minded, but followers of them. Look, how many of you see followers? How many of you kind of picture somebody walking? Yeah. You can't follow if they're not moving. Yeah. <laughs> but followers of them who through what? Faith, Faith and Jesus. patience do what? Inherit. Inherit the promises. Inheriting the promise doesn't mean you automatically now see it manifested. But you've just activated the inheritance. Amen. I want it to sink in. Can I say it again? Yes. He says, be not slothful or stubborn minded, but followers of them, meaning constantly advancing, who through faith and patience inherit promises. Now we have an inheritance, whether we activate or we're activated in it or not, but I would rather be activated in it. Yes. So I have to recognize I can't be stubborn minded but have, I have to, through faith and patience, activate my inheritance in that promise. It doesn't mean that I will see the manifestation of that promise right now. It means I have inherited it. Okay. <laughs> and here's our example. Hebrews 11. We're going to be in Hebrews a lot tonight. Hebrews 11, 8 through 10. By faith who? Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for what? An inheritance. An inheritance Obey. We talked a lot about inheritance and testing, uh, testators a couple of weeks ago. That he would after, after, after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. I've been there a lot. By faith, he what? Sojourned in a land of promise. But it was as in a strange country. Wow. Dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for something. A city that has foundations whose builder and maker is God. So why was he able to be in a strange country that was actually the promise and be okay with it, not knowing where he was going because all he was looking for was a city, a spiritual city, the kingdom, whose builder and maker is God. So he didn't have Siri. How many of you would love to have God for your navigator? Oh, you're looking for a city? I know where you're going. Oh, come on, somebody. This is good stuff tonight. But he had to ignore the fact it was a strange country. But that would have stopped a lot of people from seeing that they're in the promise. So Matthew 9, 16 and 17, you know this scripture very well. No man puts a new piece of cloth on an old garment. Let's say that new cloth is the promise. No man puts a new uh, piece of the promise on an old garment garment for that which is put in to fill it up takes from the garment and what the tear or the renting is worse neither do men put wine into old bottles else the bottles break and the wine runs out and the bottles perish but they put new wine in new bottles and both are preserved i want to share with you uh, right here uh, a dream I had last night that I really believe is a prophetic dream. And uh, also I wanted to share it on Facebook because it was one of those very vivid dreams. 
and I even wrote it down so that I wouldn't stumble through it. I was standing on what looked like a world platform. And I thought, wow, this is vast. This is amazing. But I began to see ministry leaders, most of them well-known, moving sadly to the side of the stage. And I asked one, well, what, what's wrong? And he just shook his head. Uh, and I actually recognized him. And then I looked and they were all sitting on the floor of the platform with their heads just drooped down as though they were just very ashamed. So I went up to one of them and I asked, well, what's wrong? And he pointed to their clothing. I'm trying to keep from being emotional. I noticed they all had ragged clothes on. In fact, they looked like they were, those clothes were disintegrating like burlap sacks that couldn't stay together with patches that were sought to be sewn into them as quick fixes that weren't working. And he said, we're ashamed of our clothes. And I said, well, what are you gonna do? And he said, we're gonna sit here and just hope nobody notices and as long as we can, we're just gonna sit on the platform of the world. And so I saw that the clothes had labels and the labels that were on them was past glory, religion, denomination, former moves. And I, I really began to say, oh my God, um, they are so bent on holding on to their titles of what they thought they were, that they're willing to sit there on the world stage until it's totally disintegrated. And as I was beginning to say, dear God, what? I looked in the wings <laughs> and there was a whole emerging company ready ready to come out on the stage, onto the platform. And it's like they were just waiting on some cue to say, is it okay if we come out now? And all I did was I said, come on. And they began to emerge on the stage and they all were wearing white linen as the emerging next generation that were going to reach the world. And I woke up and I, I'm telling you what, I tried to go back to sleep, but I was just like, I had to go write it down. I had to, I had to get this, not forget this. And this scripture that talks about not putting, what? Old patches on new clothes is just so, so uh, appropriate that I, I just felt like when I saw that, I had to tell this dream. Is anybody understanding what the dream is? How many believe it came from the Lord? Yes. So let's go into the potential because thank God, not all is lost. <laughs> Amen. How many believe the kingdom is rising? The kingdom message is coming and we just have to get into the next generation. So potential emerges out of the removing of former things. Promise can't come forward if you keep looking to the premise and saying, I want it this way. So Isaiah 43 verses 18 and 19, remember you not the former things. Now I wanna say on uh, Facebook, when we say former things, we're not talking about foundation. How many of you believe we need to have foundation? Yeah. We need to have fundamentals. So I'm not saying foundation or fundamentals when he says, remember not the former things. We're talking about what we made it to be and what we wanna keep it being, even though God keeps progressing and advancing his kingdom. So remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now, what? Say with me. It shall spring forth, and shall you not know it? 
And I asked God one time years ago, I said, how can I know it if it's a new thing? And he said, because it's always been in you. New didn't happen when we found it. New happened in the beginning. And now we're new creations, meaning we've been restored back to the original blueprint. So you'll know it in your belly. How many of you have heard a message and you say, I knew that, I just didn't know I knew it. That's really what this is, shall you not know it? I will even make a way, now notice what happens. I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. So when there's rivers in the desert, it ceases to be a desert. When there's a way in the wilderness, it ceases to be a wilderness. So something's got to go. So the promise can come. Wow. The promise will challenge your current premise. Come on. It will challenge your current premise or obstacle or adversary. When you see the obstacles and adversaries come up, you can very pretty much believe you're on the you're on the edge of the promise. So Hebrews 4 1, let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to what? Come short of it. What is sin? Oh, it's, you know, that terrible stuff people do. No, sin is coming short of the glory. So, lest any of you seem to come short of it. Verse 11, let us labor, or in other words, let go, labor to let go of every preconceived notion. Come on, class. I'm challenging all of us to do that. Whatever we're thinking uh, in our preconceived notion, We've got to let it go. Labor, let that go. Therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. So then the Apostle Paul makes this clear again when he says another familiar verse, Philippians 3, 12 through 14. Not as though I've already attained. Oh, I love this verse. Either we're already perfect, but I follow after that I may apprehend that for which is apprehended me. Is anybody still apprehended of purpose? Come on, say amen or something. I mean, are you, are you just apprehended? I'm apprehending that that has apprehended me. Man, I'm going to let go of anything that would hold me back or restrain me. He says, I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I don't count myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Forgetting the things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before. And that sounds like two things. Mm -hmm. He said, this one thing I do. Mm -hmm. So we could read it this way. This one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind by reaching forth to the things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God, where? In Christ Jesus. And as we said last week, what is the prize? And we often say Jesus. But now we know it's in Christ Jesus. So what is the prize in Christ Jesus? It's us. That was good, Dr. Rick. How you? So that makes us partakers. <laughs> Partakers of his divine nature. We are becoming promise producers. Note what it says in 2 Peter 1 verses 3 and 4. His divine power, authority or seal, has given us all things that pertain to glory and virtue. How many things? All things. All things. Whereby, see, you see those little attorney terms in there? Whereby the party of the first part and the party of the second part. Whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises. Notice it says of the promises that they exceed. If you're looking for a promise 
of your con preconceived notion yesterday, you're missing the promise. The promise will always challenge your premise. So that we might be partakers of his divine nature. Oh, wow. I mean, I mean that's exciting, isn't it? That I'm actually a partaker of his divine nature? Uh, yeah. How do I do that? Having escaped. Well, I thought we were waiting on the rapture for that, Dr. Rick. No, you're waiting too long. We've already escaped. Oh, I might get some letters on that in the internet. How many of you know it says we've already escaped? How did I escape? Because I'm a partaker of his divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. In other words, I've escaped being untouched by distractions of battle. It's hard to fight a battle if you're already ahead of it. Amen? How many of you believe you've already, he's already defeated the devil? And he's already won the battle. Amen? So how many of you know it's hard to fight a battle when there's nobody there to engage with you? Because it's already won. So what do you can do? Well, I guess I could get on the internet. I could get on Facebook. Or I could get into the promises. <laughs> Oh, you're so silly, Dr. Rick. <laughs> Potential is inevitable. You say, oh, I hope so. <laughs> How many of you know potential in the world means it might be? Potential in God is another word for potent. Potential is inevitable in God. Why? Because it's in a seed. You can't stop a seed from being a seed when activated through pronouncement. Pronouncement. Not just announcement, but pronouncing. Meaning we speak the promises of God. We activate the promises of God. So it says in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, in whom also you trusted after that, after that, another legal term, Ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom after that you believed what? You were sealed with what? That Holy Spirit of promise. Absolutes. Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. What is that saying, Dr. Rick? As partakers of the divine nature, he gives us an earnest down payment. So that we who now have been given authorized power can begin to activate the promises in his behalf. So when we speak it, we will automatically be resisted. When we activate it, the enemy will automatically try to make it look like it's something's going on different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. But we have to realize that's all the tricks of the enemy because he's defeated. Mm -hmm. But now we say all the promises of God in him are yes and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. So now I can begin to be that potential that's going to emerge out on the world stage as the next generation. Because it's not a matter of age. Can somebody say amen? amen. It's a matter of how willing are you to let some things go. Stop trying to patch up the old. Just to go ahead and put on the new. So, uh, Apostle Chris, would you join me up here, please, sir? And I'd like uh, some of his input on what we shared tonight. He may have something totally different, and I welcome that because that's what mentoring is all about. Let's welcome Apostle Chris. <laughs> Amen, who does this to me all the time. <laughs> Amen. Hello. Hey, God bless you. God bless you. And now for Kingdom Conversations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Only you're going to do the talking. 
Well, thank you, Dr. Yeah. Yeah. Um I think when you talk about a promise, it is basically a, it's an announced or a proclaimed um, a proclamation of God's original intention. Mm -hmm. It is a, a will, when a will is written, a last will and testament is written, <clears throat> oftentimes it is kept in obscurity. It's kept hidden. It's kept, it's not really that which is disclosed. Yeah. There's an idea that someone may be in their father's will, but mm -hmm. they don't know exactly the specifics of it. What it seems God has done is he's begun to, throughout scripture, he has given us an announcement. He's <coughs> begun to disclose to us mm -hmm. these things that he intended to give us from the very beginning mm -hmm. that were not accessible until the death of the testator. Right. In order that we may now receive the inheritance of the kingdom. So our inheritance is the promise is the announcement of that inheritance. So God is basically telling us, this is what I have for you. Yeah. And these promises that he's given to us, I believe are revelations of what God's original intent was. Mm. So what is it God, you know, you mentioned the fact that people say, well, I'm in God's will. Well, you are, but it's not because of anything that you've done right. or anything you've not done. It's because your name has been written in that will. Mm -hmm. And that is not determined by your perfection, your imperfection, your ability to live according to some moral standard. That's right. It is determined by the will of God, mm -hmm. <laughs> God's intention. Yeah. And so that basically it's kind of painting with a broad brush, but the truth of the matter is, is that you and I, mm -hmm. we have great hope concerning this inheritance. You read the scripture in Ephesians that it took believing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. believing in the message of the gospel. Once you did that, we were sealed. Yeah. With the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the down payment of our inheritance. Yeah. So what happened in our lives once we believed in the Lord, this work of the Holy Spirit in us was simply God saying, there's a whole lot more to come. This is just a down payment. Mm -hmm. Like when you buy a house, you give a down payment. Mm -hmm. You're promising the bank that there's more to come. Yeah. I'm going to be making a monthly installment to you every month. This is the beginning, but it's not the end. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, expressed in the Pentecostal world, we think that that's all of it. Mm -hmm. We live there. We stay there. We stay at the down payment. But there's, an, there's more to be accomplished. Mm -hmm. There's more to be received. And so um, he gives us these promises, these precious promises, great, exceedingly great and precious promises that we can be a partaker of this. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, 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 I think that this distinction between living right being in God's will according to the way we live and the decision we make or understanding that it was a predetermined plan of God to put our name in his will. Mm -hmm. If we would appropriate our faith in Christ, now we have access to everything mm -hmm. that he's left us. Mm -hmm. I believe that is fundamental in this and I think that it actually brings great enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. does to me anyway. Amen. What do you think about the dream? Did you, did you get anything when you heard that? Well, certainly, I think that um, I agree with you in that. Um, you know, if you had the dream, if I had the dream, we'd probably draw the same conclusions. Mm -hmm. We're like-minded in that regard. So I certainly think that um, <clears throat> there has been a global platform that has, I, I would say, probably um, in some way kind of settled for status quo rather than, you know, embracing the principles of God's kingdom in order to manifest something greater than we've ever seen before. Mm -hmm. So complacency and compromise, I think, have, have come to that platform. And I, I certainly think that there is not a move of God, but a move of his people, mm -hmm. a repositioning and a willingness to stand in those places that we've already been granted. Mm -hmm those authoritative places to demonstrate the power of that kingdom, 
but more so the authority of it. And so, you know, this, this collective group of people that you saw coming forward, um, I wouldn't call them an army, but I would certainly call them ambassadors that yeah. Yeah. are coming forth to, yeah. I believe, once again, to reveal the inheritance that's been left for the earth. Mm -hmm. um, because it's easy to settle into that place of complacency where you're just, you know, um, I, think, I think we see ministry as occupation. Mm more than we do um i think the extension and the expression of god himself in the yeah, earth yeah and so we're, we're more about gifting than we are extending mm. god's nature mm -hmm. you know our the real intent for us is to extend god's nature to express that yeah yeah and to be able to reveal that to the world because that's the that's what the world wants to connect with mm -hmm. They don't want to connect to some religious ideology that they can't even understand or that they find hypocritical. Yeah. The truth is what they really long for is something that is authentic and organic that they can actually connect to and feel the life of it flowing into yeah. them. Yeah. And and so I believe that I believe the dream has great significance in that regard. And so yeah, I I I, I believe it with all my heart. Hey Amen. Well when we say inheritance, um, what Adam lost was his inheritance also, right? Yeah, which, um, but I, maybe I should, for the sake of those watching, I don't want them to misunderstand. You know, we don't necessarily believe, or I don't necessarily believe, you may differ than this, that, that he lost heaven. Oh, no. um, I believe that he was given dominion as a part of his, it's interesting how the inheritance was given to him at the beginning of his life. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe that principally what he did was he surrendered his dominion mm -hmm. and now death reigned. Mm -hmm. So there was something, there was a shift of government. Yeah. 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 So inherit, what are we actually inheriting? The kingdom. The kingdom. And so the kingdom needs a domain, right? Yes. The king's domain. And so we know the realm of the king is what he rules, mm -hmm. uh, but his creation is part of that, isn't it? Of course. So when he came to seek and save that which was lost, he wasn't just talking about people. He's also talking about his uh, cosmos, right? Yeah, the order, the arrangement, the, the the original intent. You know, God, God, when He created everything, He created, it. and we, we, you know, we see it in this seven day play out. But the reality of it was, we don't know if that was a day as was a thousand yeah. years with the Lord. It could have been seven thousand years. We don't know. But the fact is, is that He didn't just present. Scripture in Genesis doesn't just present us with the idea that, that he only created or that he created these things with uh, independent from one another as far as global, you know, his overall purpose. Mm -hmm. So all of it, when you put all of it, and if you were to paint it all out on a, on a, on a canvas, it all speaks of the order God created yeah. in the beginning. Yeah. The order of it was all parts of creation mm. in harmony with man yeah. and man in harmony with all creation. This order is what actually created the most conducive relationship between him and mankind and mm -hmm. him and the earth because death had not entered in. So when it says for God so loved the world, what God really loved was the order. Yeah. Because when the order is right, the relationship is going to be right. Mm -hmm. And so I believe it's important for us to understand that provision and prosperity do not gravitate toward anything other than order. If, right. if, when things are out of order, because they can't, they can't hold on and they can't. Uh, they can't can uh, they can't hold on and, and maintain mm -hmm. the provision and the prosperity mm -hmm. if it's out of order. In other words, if you give a million dollars to someone whose life is full of chaos, they won't hold it. Yeah. Right? So when provision comes, it is only maintained where order is. Mm -hmm. The reason God loved the order that he created was because of the fact that it was able to sustain his glory. It was yeah. able to sustain the principal way of living. And so I believe that's what God really is wanting to 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 to, to really restore wow, that's should, awesome that, in that's, fact it, it says it says so much because we're partakers of the divine nature yes. and that's you know i think when we think of promises in religious terms we've thought of it as well it's a promise like we make a promise to someone and i'll do this maybe and but the promises of god are powerful mm -hmm. yeah. and what he what he sees in you is that partaking of the divine nature through that promise mm -hmm. and that promise then in him begins to impact a nation and begins to change the landscape. 
the promises of God and, and what I saw in that dream uh, is coming to flourish. And I really believe we're beginning to see it, it. Those promises are beginning to impact the earth and beginning to, uh, to change the landscape. So we're going to say good night for now and have our round table and everybody say it together to the king.